Psalter reading is from Psalm 14. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abdominal thing, deeds. There is none that does good. The Lord looks down from heaven to see if there are any that act wisely, that seek after God. Oh, that deliverance for Israel that would come out of Zion when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people. Jacob shall rejoice. Israel shall be glad. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel reading is Luke chapter 15, beginning with the first verse. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawn near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance." Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek dil diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Psalm 14 says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Uh, we've begun this uh, Good Question series, a uh, short video every week, emails that I send, podcast. I hope you're paying attention to this, by the way. This is the very best that I have in my mind and my heart to give you, the people that I love. We began by asking the question, is there a God? It's interesting to me. Uh, from Bible times, saying there was a fool who said there is no God. In Bible times, everybody believed in God. Actually, most people believed in many gods. You would be hard to scare up somebody who said, I don't believe that there is a God. In today's world, there are plenty of people who would say, I, I don't believe in God. It's actually almost become cool. Best-selling religion books are about that there is no God, atheism, and so on. Some very smart people that I know and love would say there is no God. Some of the wisest people that I know would say there is no God. Although once in a while, when somebody says to me there's no God, I, I, I find myself a little bit uh, puzzled. Uh, they say, no, there's not a God. Uh, is, is it the God that we know? I, I was interviewing the other day for a podcast, my friend Lillian Daniel, a UCC minister up in Michigan. <laughs> She wrote a book a while back called, I'm Tired of Apologizing for a Church I Don't Belong to. I, I think I'd change that to say, I'm tired of apologizing for a God that I don't believe in. So some people say, I don't believe in God, and, and they just say the darndest things. Some people say things like, look at the harm that's been done by religion. And I can only counter by saying, look at the harm that's been done by atheism. I'll give you two names, Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin. Like, atheists aren't exactly nice guys, right? Some people say, I don't believe in God because I don't believe God really created the world in six days. I don't personally know anyone who thinks God really did make everything in six literal 24-hour days. Uh, some people say to me, I don't believe in God because I don't think miracles are 
possible? I get that question, although I don't know about you, I hope that this world isn't all there is, that everything isn't cause and effect, that it's not all up to me making it happen, that there is some mystery, there is some force beyond just us, there's something to help us out down here. Sometimes when I'm talking to somebody they say they don't believe in God, they'll say to me, it's always so interesting, they'll say, have you noticed that there is evil in the world? And I always respond by saying, no. <laughs> really? I don't think any Christian theologian has ever thought, oh, there's evil in the world. Can we deal? I'm being a smart aleck now. Some people say I don't believe in God because there can't be such a thing as eternal life. Yeah, I get that too, although... You know, I find in myself and in most people that I know, there's kind of a hankering for more than we have here. The, and it, it's so interesting. I see people sometimes when someone they love is about to die, and they're trying to find the words to say goodbye, but it's hard to say goodbye because everything in us is wired to say what? See you later. See you later. See you later. There's some future, we hope. People I know who don't believe in God, someone they love dies, and they'll say to me, I can't believe she's really gone. Uh, September 11th, uh, 21 years now. I remember the year after the first September 11th, we had big services in all of the churches. And I remember the time thinking, I hope this doesn't become like an annual thing, but it is an annual thing, isn't it? We turned on television last night. There were specials about the firefighters and heroes and people that were lost and families that were uh, broken. Everybody's got their story from 9-11, right? And it's forever imprinted in our minds. Uh, mine goes like this. I got up that Tuesday morning. It seemed like a normal morning. I had a breakfast meeting uh, outside of the building. I got to my office uh, something after 9 o'clock. I don't remember. And my expectation was that, you know, my, everybody would be in their offices, but people weren't in their offices. Everybody was in the front office. And somebody had wheeled a television in there, and I thought, what is this? And I walked in, and we were all looking then at images on a television screen that we could not process. Goodness. And I remember a message came from the schools. I had children in three different schools at that point. And the message from the schools was, uh, you know, we can keep your children here, but if you want, you can come and pick them up. <laughs> I, have, hmm, I will be picking up my children and bringing them home. And for the next week or two, I just couldn't sleep at night. I don't know if you could. I just could not sleep at night. And when I couldn't sleep, what I would do is I would go in my children's rooms one by one. And I would just watch them sleep. I would hover over them with no illusion that I could protect them with some sense of, uh, what is this world? that they're growing up in, that they will forever be impacted by. Uh, when 9-11 happened, uh, there was a lot of commentary on what, what had we witnessed here? Was, was this war? Was it an attack on democracy? Was it an attack on freedom? There's a lot of talk about what it was. What was it? I, I, I had some ideas about what it was that people maybe weren't ready to hear in that moment. Two things. One is, the first was that what we saw on 9-11 uh, was, um, I don't know how to put it, religion, belief in God gone haywire. We saw belief in God gone haywire in two ways, I would dare to suggest to you. The first was the attackers took a religion and perverted it and twisted it into something that could justify and even be gleeful about violence against people who are hated. That was a twisting, a bizarre perversion of religion. But then there was another kind of odd thing with uh, 
religion gone haywire on our end. The number one question that I got in the days following 9-11, they actually called me from Channel 3 the day of 9-11, asked me to come down and be on screen for a while and answer people's questions. The first question that day and in the days to come was, we thought God would always protect us. Why didn't God protect us? And all we can say is that the protection of America or us as individuals, that's not a thing that is promised to us. It's dangerous down here. It was dangerous for Jesus down here. So we saw religion go on haywire. The other thing we saw was, it seems like an oversimplification, doesn't it? What Osama bin Laden and the hijackers did, it, it was sin. It was sin. God has an order to the world, and God says, here are the ways that you should act, and here are the ways that you should not act, and those people acted contrary to the will of God. It was a sin against God Almighty, although we dare not say, well, those guys are sinners. We are all of us sinful. President George Bush did what a president should do in the days after something like 9-11. He told what America's plan would be, and he said this. He said, we're going to rid the world of evil. Robert Bella of Harvard responded to this by saying, how are we going to rid the world of evil? I can't rid my own heart of evil. We're all broken. We're all sinful. And the question is, what does that mean? Uh, what do we make of that? I guess I grew up thinking that sin was, uh, I know God doesn't want me to do something, but I make a boo-boo and I do it. If I apologize to God, I, I'll, I'll be out of trouble with God. Like God's the black robe judge. I say, guilty, please forgive me for my sin. My obvious uh, mistake here. Maybe it's a little bit different. There was a, a, a rabbi in the Middle Ages who preached a sermon on the Psalm 14. It says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. And the sermon included this There was an architect who built a city with secret chambers and hiding places in it. And then he was made governor of the city. There were some thieves in the city. So when he set out to catch the thieves in the city, they ran off and sought to hide themselves in those hiding places. He said to them, you fools, would you hide yourselves from me? I am the one who built this city. I know the way in and out of the hiding places better than you. <laughs> like, is, is sin, like, we'll hide from God, but God made and knows the hiding places. <laughs> we can't hide from God. Do we even really want to hide from God? My morning devotion this morning included a lovely thought from a Catholic theologian named James Allison. He said this, sin is addiction to being less than yourself. Sin is the addiction to being less than yourself. I thought about my children. A lot of you here, your parents, you have young children. I'm sure they're just darlings, and they always do exactly what you wish for them, and they're always just utterly pleasing to you. When my children were little, and that happened sometimes, uh, quite often I, the Howell children would do dumb, 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 dumb things. Just dumb. You can't believe how dumb my three children could be. And when they would do dumb, dumb, dumb things, I probably had a few days where I just got angry with them, but I don't think so. I think on most days they would do something dumb, 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 and I would talk to them and I would say, is this who you are? Is this who you really want to be? Is this what you want your life to be like? Aren't you better than this? Maybe God looks to see us and sees us and asks, aren't you better than this? Years ago, some of you have been here long enough to remember when um, Elisa Lassiter was uh, one of our pastors here. Uh, she's a pastor up in Germantown, Pennsylvania now, and uh, we stay in good touch. And uh, I invited Elisa back when she was pastor up in D.C. to do a program with me. And I said, we'll have a conversation on stage. And she said, uh, what's our topic? And I said, I'm not going to tell you. 
And the fool would say in his heart, there is no God. The fool would say yes to such an invitation. I knew if I gave her a topic, she would over-prepare and be nervous about it. I said, just come, you're going on your feet, we'll just talk. So she comes, and we are perched on chairs in front of a bunch of people in Jubilee Hall, maybe a few of her there. And so she looks at me, and we began. And I said, Elisa, tell us, what is God like? She paused for a very long time. And then she let out this sigh. <sighs> and then she said, I think God is like the woman in that story that Jesus told who lost one of her coins. And she swept the floor. And she got down on her hands and knees and brought a lamp out and she would not rest until she found that one coin. Is that what God is like? Is God not like that shepherd? He's got a hundred sheep. That's a big crowd of sheep. And he loses one of them, and if you're a shepherd with any sense, you say, I still got 99. This is great. I got 99 of my sheep. But no, the shepherd that is like God says, there's one loss. I won't rest until I find that one. Until I find that one. What is God like what we believe in the church is something you can never persuade an atheist into is that we believe that God there is a God but that God didn't just remain remote but that God came down and became one of us entered into our realm <laughs> into our world you know when Queen Elizabeth died sent me scrambling through books that I have about Queen Elizabeth and uh, I recalled something I hadn't thought about in a long time when Winston Churchill uh, met Elizabeth. She was like two days old. And he uh, paid her a visit. And, you know, Churchill famously always said, all babies look like me. <laughs> Which was funny. When he saw little Elizabeth, he didn't say, that baby looks like me. Instead, what Churchill said was, this child has an air of authority and reflectiveness that is astonishing in an individual. An air of authority and reflectiveness. Did he see that? Did he want to see that? When Jesus was born, did Mary and Joseph and the Magi and the shepherds, did they look at this child and say, it looks like Churchill? No, they looked at this child and did they think, this child has an air of authority and reflectiveness and that child grew up and Jesus became a king but he wasn't a king like any other king like the presidents that we've known or the rulers that we've known he became a king you know, I look back in Sally Bedell Smith's biography of Queen Elizabeth and on the very last page <laughs> she refers to how Queen Elizabeth thought about being a queen she used the phrase over and over that I am to be the light above politics and then she said, the virtue of having a queen is the prime minister is never number one. Like in America, the president, he's number one. The president's number one. But in England, the prime minister is never number one. The queen is number one. And I thought about that. Like that, That's how it really is in our lives, isn't it? Like if, if there's no God, you're number one. It's all up to you. You got to make it happen. There's nothing else. You're just on your own. You got the whole world on your shoulders. You are number one. And advertisers, everybody else says you're number one. But in church, we say you're never number one. God's always number one. The pressure's off. God's got the world in his hands. I, I don't have to be number one. Here, here's the last thing, and I'll be done. Psalm 14, it begins, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. But then, do you notice what it added? Did you hear it when Jamie read it? It says, the Lord looks down to see if there are any who act righteously. It does not say, the Lord looks down to see if there are any who believe there's a God. The Lord looks down to see if there are any who have faith in God. No, it says, the Lord looks down to see if there are any who act righteously righteously. Recently, I've been telling you about Father Greg Boyle, who works with gang members in California, and his great quote, I, I quote in a sermon, everybody says, send me that quote. His great quote is, faith is not saluting a set of beliefs, but faith is being a companion of Christ, and especially caring for those that everyone else in the world despises and leaves out. That's what faith is. 
It's an action. I, um, I, you, those of you who know me know that it just pains me to be critical of anything associated with the University of North Carolina. It just... But I want to talk about a professor of religion there whose name is Bart Ehrman. Bart's a brilliant uh, man, much published scholar. Some of you may have studied under Bart. And his uh, academic career has been a long exercise in trashing Jesus and in trashing people who believe in God. That's what he's been about. A few years back, I remember thinking, I want to have a conversation with Bart Ehrman. So I, I called him, got no response. I emailed him, got no response. I emailed him again. <laughs> Got no response. I found people who know the both of, both of us, and I said, can you just give me a conversation with them? I want to talk to them, and I never got a response. I kind of forgot about it until Christmas Eve, this particular year. And we have multiple services here, and I had finished the 6 o'clock service, and I went back to my office just to chill for a couple minutes before the 8 o'clock, and so I sat down at my desk, and my computer's there, and I hear this bing. Email popped into my box. I looked over. It's Bart Ehrman on Christmas Eve. I opened the email really rapidly. He said, I don't really need to talk to you. He said, you're not really going to convince me of anything. He said, here's why. He said, I know you Christians tonight are raising candles very piously while people outside your building are hungry. I thought, good point. I hit reply. And I said, Professor Ehrman, thank you for responding, and you are correct. I've had four services already where we've raised candles, and I've got two to go. So that's the thing that we do. I do have to tell you that on this night, we collect an offering for the people outside our building who are hungry. Except last year, it was about $100,000. And this year, I'm sure it will be more. The Lord looks down to see if there are any who act righteously. You know, what's the point of church? You came today. What's the point of church? We're tearing down a building. We're building back a new building. Is it so, oh, we can have a nice building. I don't think that's what it's about. I think the whole point of church is uh, it's well captured. I thought about this driving over this morning. So this isn't, you know, like fully well baked in my mind, but I think it works. I was driving over this morning. I remember Lorraine Hansberry's play Raisin in the Sun, which is a great work of literature. And my favorite scene in Raisin in the Sun is there's this African-American family, and none of them have ever been to college, but one daughter grows up, and she goes away to college. Oh, they're so proud of her. And she comes back for Christmas break, and she is informing them all the great things that she has learned, the great intellect that she now has, how very smart she is becoming since she has gone off to a college and gotten out of this hick town. And she's talking and they're all very impressed until she says this. She said, I, I, even, I, even, I even have begun to, to, to doubt God. I've even come to think that I, I, I don't even believe in God. Her mother sprung up out of her chair, walked over to her daughter, slapped her in the face, and said, repeat after me, in my mother's house there still is a God. When you do what you've done today, we build a church building. What we're doing to an unbelievable, unbelieving world, a cynical world, a lost world, we are saying <laughs> there still is a God. There still is a God. It's the God that can't bear for one sheep to be lost. The God who can't bear to lose one coin, one of us. You know, we're the evidence. There's no other evidence. We're the evidence that there is a God. And the Lord is looking down to see who will act righteously, who will be my evidence that I am real. It's a privilege. It's a joy. Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm.